Hello and welcome to the Raising Kellen podcast. My name is Ma Schneider and I blog at raisingkellen.org where we curate resources for parents raising children with disabilities. As always, remember the content on this podcast is for your information only, and if you seek advice for your specific situation, to contact a trained professional. We have less than a month to go for Day at the Lake. This is our first live in person event that brings together parents, teachers, and other service providers to learn about resources available in Dyersburg, Tennessee. This episode, as well as a legacy sponsor of Day at the Lake, is Anderson Consulting, your one stop shop for your home and business IT needs. On today's episode 94, we chat with Jay Campolino. So put those feet up, grab a cup of coffee, and get ready for some awesome conversation. Jay Campolino, welcome to the Raising Killing podcast. We are so honored to have you here with us today. Oh, Marsh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm very, very excited to present some information about this new program being rolled out by uh, the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Thank you for, for this opportunity. Guys, just to give you all a little bit of background, I met Shay at this year's uh, ARC Mega Disability Conference, which happened in Nashville, Tennessee. And I got the opportunity to listen to Jay present and what a presentation it was. Both, uh, it was content that really excited me as a parent. They just appears to me, Jay, to be a statewide transformation uh, as far as services for uh, individuals with disabilities. So if you ever have an opportunity, guys, um, listening today, think about the Mega Disability Conference as an opportunity to learn and grow. Uh, getting back to our conversation, Jay is the current Youth and Transitions Director with the State of Tennessee at the Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Moving here forward, I'm going to refer to it as DIDD. Jay is charged with developing and overseeing the implementation of MAPS. So MAPS, guys, is the Medicaid Alternate Pathways to Independence Program. Jay, before we delve into MAPS, would you kindly let us know just a little something about yourself and how you came to DIDD to start up this program? Oh, absolutely. And, and what a great question and a great segue to start off our conversation. Uh, my entire professional career has been focused in this industry. I started my career, oh gosh, in the late 90s, 1997, 1998 essentially providing uh, direct support professional services to a class member that had transitioned out of one of the state institutions. Uh, immediately in this role, I found my passion. I was working hands-on with a gentleman who was very severely involved with his day-to-day -day needs, and I found myself uh, developing a relationship with this gentleman and assisting him in virtually every activity of daily living. Uh, I often tell people that my single greatest accomplishment of my career is helping that young man learn how to take a bite of food for himself. It was simply the greatest moment in my career. Uh, at that point, I was working with my wife and we were learning this industry together. And after we fell you know, feet first into this industry, I, I found myself wanting more. And so working in the private sector, I began expanding my professional career to provide a host of administrative and, and direct management supports. Ultimately, uh, conducting some of the services as a house manager, a middle manager of an, of, of an entire operational hub, and then moving up to progress as an executive director where I supported one of the larger family model or foster-based 
organizations here in Middle Tennessee for adults and children uh, with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Uh, however, through that experience, I, I maintained my close proximity to direct support care. Uh, I opened up my home and provided foster-based services for an adult with intellectual or developmental disabilities, which gave me firsthand insight to what it is like living with a person with intellectual or developmental disabilities and meeting their needs on a day-to-day -day basis. I got to see the benefits of that program, and I also saw some of the unintended consequences that result uh, as, as, a pro as, a, as having a close proximity to folks that you are caring for. I'll talk a little bit more about those unintended consequences down the line. But 20 years later, I found myself being drawn out of the private sector to a program that was newly being developed at the state of Tennessee's Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities called MAPS. I discovered that there was uh, an initiative from the state of Tennessee, and at this point, I really need to tip my hat to those legislators, the governor, the commissioner of DIDD, uh, Commissioner Brad Turner, for having the foresight to recognize the need and continuing to expand the services that are being offered within the state of Tennessee's service network. And it was this program uh, that you mentioned earlier called the Medicaid Alternative Pathways to Independence Program, better known as MAPS. And from here on forward, I'll, I'll, I'll call it MAPS, that really intrigued me. The, the foundational components of the MAPS program really just touched every fiber of my essence. It just, it really just captivated everything that I have learned in my 20 years experience leading up to the opportunity to get involved with such a unique and, and, and fascinating program that we're rolling out here within the state of Tennessee. So fast forward all of that time as of April of 2022 is when I got involved with the state's initiative to launch this program. And I've been spending my time ever since talking about this program, developing it, fostering relationships, and essentially getting prepared to launch this program uh, throughout the state of Tennessee. A little bit about my history. Um, it, it's deeply rooted in providing direct support services to folks with special needs and recognizing that it's at that phase where the magic happens. So everything that I do comes from that perspective. How can we ensure that the services at that level are, are reaching the intended goals that we have identified? I hope that helps provide a little bit of context about what brought me here and what, what motivates me to do what I do, Marsh. Thank you for that question. Jay, I'm just a little bit curious. How, what is MAPS actually? Who is the um, recipient of the program um, and that's what I'm really interested in is it your um, is it your 12 year old your 16 year old your 21 year old how does the program work and gosh that that onion has so many layers but definitely one that I enjoy talking with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and I, I've told people as well that the development and implementation of MAPS is probably my second favorite experience that I've enjoyed in my entire professional career, going back to that first where I was the direct support professional. But the concept of MAPS began simply enough where there was some fundamental concepts that were developed. And so we start there. We start with those fundamental concepts as to what we are going to build this program around. And these concepts centered around um, some big ticket items such as technology and employment and value-based payments and offering services to folks that begin at that transition age. And then lastly, that fundamental concept of person-centered practices. So we take all of these big ticket concepts and we, we begin conceptualizing and developing the overall implementation of the program. And so when we take those big ticket approaches, we have to develop the program 
in a format that is understandable, that people can relate to, and that we can communicate to the community that this is what we are intending to do with this program. And so we take those fundamental concepts and we start drilling down. We start developing what the overall outcome areas are. If we recognize a person as somebody that is interested in improving their quality of life, gaining more access to independent living, how can we implement those fundamental concepts into a service program where that person will benefit from those fundamental concepts? And so from that design, we categorized three main outcome areas where we hope to provide opportunities for services for folks that enroll within the program. Individuals that were enroll within the program will focus on these three main outcome areas of services at home, services at work, and services in the community. Those are the three main outcome areas which essentially start how we begin to communicate to the community, this is what the program is going to offer for folks with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Those three main, main outcome areas are very broad. And even when we talk about them, there's still, there's so many questions that arise. Well, what are we going to do for folks to help them in their home setting? What are we going to do for folks to help them at their work setting? So we continue to dive down deeper into those layers of that onion, and we begin identifying what's called milestones. Each outcome area will have specific milestone goals that we offer for those folks that enroll within the program. And so you take, for example, the home outcome area. Within the home outcome area, we have identified four milestone goals that people that enroll within the program can choose to work on over the course of their MAPS programming period. And these milestones vary from home and safety to financial management to uh, health management. Essentially, we describe how individuals can choose what they wish to work on over the course of their MAPS programming year they select those milestone goals, and then we as a collective team help that person achieve independence using those foundational principles of technology, value-based payment, and beginning to offer these services for that transitional age population. It's a long dive into some of the information about the program, to circle back to your initial question, Marsh, about who is this program for? And so now that we've got that general foundation of what MAPS is, those, found, those foundational principles, now we can take that deeper dive and begin describing who this program is for. And we have envisioned, ever since we have focused on the primary support strategy being technological supports, we focus that individuals that are within that transition age group, those high school students that are about to exit the high school, the high school system can assimilate to many of the technology supports that we have developed within the program. So the short answer to your question is, MAPS is intended for that tra those transition aged persons that are nearing the exit of the high school. MAPS services are good for three years. It is what is recognized as a short-term service. In comparison, the other services offered through DIDD, for example, the Employment and Community First Choices Program, is what's recognized as a long-term service. There is a fundamental difference in that MAPS is only good for three years and the Employment Community First Choices Program is a long-term service. And so recognizing that the transition-aged group that apply to enroll within the MAPS program, if we can utilize technological solutions to offer independent strategies to these folks, 
the hope is at the conclusion of the three years, they won't need our support anymore. We will have equipped those persons with access to the techno technological solutions that exist that can help that person continue to maintain independent living throughout those outcome areas of home, work, and community so that at, at the conclusion of three years, we have really worked ourselves out of a job. Now, in the creation of the program, we knew we would have to specify who exactly is MAPS intended to support. And so the age demographic is only one consideration. Considering that MAPS is a three-year program, we hope to tie in the MAPS services with those people that are about to leave the high school within that period of three years. So if somebody is planning to leave the high school setting at age 21, they would be able to begin their MAP services at the age of 18 or 19. If those persons are planning to exit the high school at age 18, they would be eligible beginning 15 or 16. So that age demographic is one consideration. The second consideration is that the person does have to have a diagnosis of an intellectual or a developmental disability. During the enrollment and application process, which I know we will talk about probably in a little bit more, we talk, we discover that there is confirmation and correspondence that confirms the person has a primary diagnosis of an intellectual or developmental disability. The third component is that they live within the state of Tennessee. Those essentially are the three main components that we evaluate for enrollment into um, the MAPS program. The second component is that the person can not already receive another long-term service such as the ECF Choices Program. If somebody is already enrolled in the ECF program, they would be unable to enroll within the MAPS program. And those are the criteria that we identify for. So those transition-aged individuals, as long as they meet those criteria, they can enroll, they can choose which services of the list of milestones and outcomes they, that they wish to work on. And then we will partner with vendors to help those persons achieve independence in those particular areas. Does that help at all? It does, but I tell you what, my PC brain is switching on. So EFC choices cannot run in tandem with MAPS. That is correct. Okay. So the primary distinction is if a, if a person is already receiving what's classified as a long-term service, which is the Employment Community First Choices Program, or ECF, or if they are in another classified long-term service state-funded program, they would not be able to receive MAPS and that long-term service at the same time. Jay, being in a more rural community, let me back up. I loved your presentation at Mega uh, Disability Conference, where I believe it was the uh, the individual from Chattanooga who, with the aid of a iPad or some communicative device, was able to use public transport from, I believe, from his home to work. Right. Correct. In, in my community, what would happen if perhaps public transport was like not an option? For example, say Kellen was actually living with me, but he wants to live independently. Maps is not going to cover every single aspect of his independence because that is largely going to be uh, led by the resources that are currently in the community, right? But just some kind of idea of some of the possibilities that, that may exist. Mars, that's a fantastic segue to begin talking in and about some of the technological solutions that we have built within the, the approach of MAP services. And so at this point, I would love to introduce what's called a virtual community resource map. 
at the state of Tennessee, we love acronyms. We will put an acronym to everything. And so the virtual community resource map is no different. We call the virtual community resource map a VCRM. And it was through the identification that there are a number of resources in the community that exist. And oftentimes coordination of these resources can be complicated. Or what you see is that these resources are accessible in silos. They don't coexist with one another. The notion of a virtual community resource map pulls all of these resources into a single source that is available over a virtual platform. And I might add, it is available right now for everyone via Google My Maps. It is a free platform that exists for everybody. I currently and personally have my own virtual community resource map. I am a strong advocate that this approach is going to be something that is beneficial to everyone. So the concept of a VCRM allows us to begin identifying all of those resources, persons, specific places, specific places of interest that are important to the person and program them into a virtual platform that can be accessed via a mobile device. We all carry cell phones in our pocket on a day-to-day -day basis. I sometimes have two or three on me depending on what I'm doing each day. The folks that we support within the MAPS program can also request for MAPS to send them a cell phone in which we pay for the phone, we pay for all of the data that's associated with the phone in hopes that the person can use this phone and the collective resources that have been input into that person's specific virtual community resource map. Now this person has in their pocket the ability to pull out that map and identify all of those resources that exist within that person's traditional community that will include transportational uh, options that exist. Now, unfortunately, transportation is an issue within those rural areas. And the virtual community resource maps and maps can only pull together the resources that do currently exist in that traditional community. However, I mentioned during the foundational components of the program that we take a person-centered approach, that transportation and transportation needs should look different for, for people as they do in their traditional community. You witnessed a video of Kenny using public transportation via a public bus to navigate from their home to their employment site using additional technologies through an application that's called Wayfinder. There are other technological solutions that we offer as an alternative within the MAPS program that can exist with the virtual community resource map that allows us to identify person-specific routes where Kellen, if we identify that he would like to go from his home to his friend's house down the street or across town, we can pre-program mobile applications that will provide him with step-by-step -step directions on how to get from his home to his friend's house across town. And those directions will look very specific to that particular person. Some folks may need those step-by-step -step directions that begin at their home that says, Jay, you are going to your mother's house. Go ahead and grab your keys so you can lock your door. Once I use these mobile applications, I can then progress to the next step that may tell me, Jay, exit your front door don't forget to lock your door. The third step may be, Jay, walk down your sidewalk to the driveway. Step four, turn left at your driveway 
and somebody will pick you up at that location. So now we get into the specifics of what transportation options exist for that person. I have a gentleman that lives in our East Tennessee area that has developed those individual routes using their own mode of transportation. For example, they may ride their bike to a, a friend's house across the street. There may be the, the opportunity for a person to ambulate themselves, walking from their home to their friend's house across town or whatever close proximity exists. Our hope is that we can approach the navigation needs to identify what the person needs and what resources may exist within their traditional community to include public transportation, but not to only include public trans transportation. Can we identify natural supports or other family members or uh, potentially Lyft or Uber or other modes of transportation that may exist that can be used through the virtual community resource map, the Wayfinder application that can help that person get to the, those locations that they are interested in achieving. So now we have began diving a little bit deeper into the MAPS program. We talked about those, those initial foundational components. We built into the structure of the outcomes and the milestones, and now we've dived a little bit deeper into that foundational components of enabling technology. The very first milestone that we work on with everyone that enrolls within the MAPS program is that creation of that virtual community resource map. We believe that if we can help those folks identify those resources and those tools and those people that are important to them, let's help that person program those resources into their phone. Now the person can use that virtual community resource map through the course of their MAPS program and continue to refer back to that virtual community resource map as the tool that it is intended. Secondly, we have created a customized state-of-the-art travel training curriculum where individuals can actually receive training. And when I say individuals, I mean the likes of Kellen and or the staff that may work with him to help them safely navigate their communities, identifying safety issues or identifying needs that you may have for personal crosswalks or uh, utilizing public transit if it exists. And so now we continue to build on the implementation of technological solutions at every phase of the MAPS program. So we talked about the transportation, right? Let's move on to the next component of employment. So this is going to be a twofold uh, question regarding employment and vocational rehab, and perhaps is there a relationship or not with MAPS, okay? Kiran wants a part-time job in the community. How will MAPS help him to source that job? Is there a role there? Beautiful question, and the short answer is vocational rehabilitation and MAPS can occur at the same time. We believe if somebody has an open VR case, let MAPS work with that person also. The fundamental goal is what? To get a job. Yeah. Let us both work together to ensure that we are achieving that goal. Within the, the employment outcome, developed within MAPS, there are four milestones that Kellen could choose from. If he wishes to get a job, he could simply choose over that course of that MAPS year to say, I want my goals this year to be employment. And so within that program year, he could choose which one of the four milestones he wishes to work on during that year. It, and I have to tip my hat to our employment and inclusive community services director, Carrie Berna. She has developed a beautiful and seamless employment path system that somebody could start their employment path and at the conclusion of one or two goals, they can already have a job. We don't have to go through a series of all of these 
steps to get a job like we experience in some of our other programs. If Kellen wants to get a job, we start there. We work the first milestone to actually identify where he wants to work, and then we work the second milestone to physically get him a job. And that includes conducting resumes or completing resumes, going on evaluation sites, completing applications, and going through actual interviews. We would be with Kellen every step of that way to secure him employment within the community. And at the conclusion of that milestone, when Kellen meets his goal, that is when we pay our provider agencies that are implementing the program. This is a major distinction within the program. You recall that I mentioned a foundational component of MAPS is value-based payment. We will pay our providers when they help somebody achieve their goal and only then. We are not going to pay along the way just for a sample service. We want the outcome. We want Kellen to get a job. And when he gets a job, that's when we pay the provider for the work that they did. Hope that helps answer that question, Marsh. Gee, it really does. I would love to see how the program evolves. You very succinctly told us exactly what MAPS is and what it does. And just to let listeners know, I'll please do check out the MAPS program that is run by the DIDD uh, here in the state of Tennessee. Jay, before we leave, is there anything that you would like to leave us with? Uh, one last tidbit, Marsh. Thank you for this. Um, it is a new program, and I have approached the entire creation and implementation of this program with two major concepts in mind. One is transparency. I will answer any question that anyone has at any time. I will make as much information accessible to anyone at any time. And it is in this approach of transparency that I ask for a little bit of, of grace. It, since it is a new program, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to learn along the way when we make those mistakes. And as a result, my second approach that I present any opportunity I get is collaboration. I need to hear from people how they are uh, appreciating or experiencing their MAPS services. I need to know what's working and what's not working so that we can continue to learn along the way. And along the way, I will continue to make all of this information transparent and available so that we as a collective group can learn and continue to improve, improve this program. I would encourage anyone to go to our MAPS website. The beginning application process starts there. Anyone that is interested can go and complete an application, and the process should take no more than five minutes. Oftentimes, state programs are so difficult to submit applications and receive services. I am proud of the work that we've done to make this as easy and seamless as possible. So one, I'm completely available should you have any questions. Two, go ahead and go to our website, complete that application, and let us see how we can help you achieve MAPS results and greater independent living opportunities within your community. Thank you for this opportunity, Marsh. I would be more than happy to come back at some point and tell you what we've learned over this time. And if there are any other questions, you know how to reach me. Excellent, Jay. Thank you so much for your time and hope to see you soon. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening along on today's podcast. For more information about Day at the Lake, be sure to check out the RaisingKellen.org website and join our Facebook page for up-to-date information. Again, thank you to Anderson Consulting for your legacy sponsorship of Day at the Lake. We sincerely appreciate a rate and review of today's episode on your podcast platform. And as always, remember, get to the top of your mountain. This is Marsh Naidu signing off. <music>